Jenny here from Age UK Trafford. Today's video we're going to take a little bit of a walk down memory lane. Um, we are aware that it's the VE Day celebrations on Friday, so 75 years since the ending of the war with Germany. And today we're going to have a little bit of a look back, a bit of a reminiscence about that period in time. Some of you may well have first hand experience. Others may well have memories from um, friends and family that they've discussed with you. So sit back with me now um, and let's have a listen about how times um, were then, um, how times have changed over the years, and actually how times are really quite similar to the, the situation that, that we currently find ourselves in. Enjoy. On September the 3rd, 1939, Neville Chamberlain told the nation that for the second time in many people's lives, the country was at war with Germany. Minutes after he finished speaking, the air raid sirens sounded, and this was precisely what millions of Britons most feared. The first war measure was the introduction of a blackout, which was originally enforced by a civilian army of ARP wardens or air raid precaution wardens. In the first few months of the blackout, people rallied behind the efforts of the ARP wardens, but when the air raids didn't come, a mood of resentment against them took hold. But people did as they were told and put that light out. Street lamps were turned off, railway carriages were fitted with bulbs that gave off only a dim blue glow and householders were required to cover their windows with thick curtains so that not the slightest chink of light could escape. An immediate consequence was a dramatic increase in accidents. Thick white lines were painted on road curbs and lamp posts to help people to see where they were going, but cars continued to crash. The government urged citizens to wear something white at night and the shops had a run on white coats, mats, furs, and white bands for hats. Another very tangible sign that Britain was at war was the absence of children from towns and cities. In anticipation of German air attacks, the government had organised an evacuation. It began on Friday, September the 1st, as news of the German invasion of Poland came through. In just two days, more than 1.5 million children, pregnant women and other vulnerable people, such as the disabled, were sent away to small corners of the island. Walter Elliott, the Minister for Health at the time, described it as an exodus bigger than that of Moses. The name of the game changed on Saturday, September the 7th, 1940. On the first night of the Blitz, the fires in the East End burned so brightly that you could read a newspaper by their light in Shaftesbury Avenue, five miles away. By morning, 430 people had been killed and 1,600 seriously wounded. Air Raid Warden Celia Fremlin saw some initial signs of panic in a street shelter in Cable Street, Whitechapel. But four nights later, they were all much calmer. They brought stools to sit on and there was even a bit of a community sing-song. Apparently once you've gone through three nights of bombing and come out alive, you can't help feeling safe the fourth time. Millions were given a government issue, do-it-yourself cave, to be installed in the back garden. The Anderson shelter was named after Sir John Anderson, the minister responsible for civil defence. It consisted of 14 sheets of corrugated iron and formed a shell six foot high, four and a half foot wide and six and a half foot deep. The idea was to plant the shelter in a deep hole, like a kind of sunken garden shed. Some families grew vegetables in the protective bank of earth which surrounded the shelter. Others tried to add homely touches within a vase of flowers, a strip of lino. There was no disguise in the fact that the shelters were cramped. They could sleep six adults on narrow bunks like submarines. And they tended to flood in wet weather. Yet they were sturdy and could survive almost anything. But a direct hit. Many a family owed its life to the Anderson. 
Herbert Morrison, Anderson's successor, also gave his name to a shelter. The Morrison was a box-like structure with a steel plate on top. It could be used as a table in the daytime. Few were delivered in time for the Blitz, but were effective in later raids. <coughs> the Morrison <coughs> proved capable of withstanding the collapse of a two-storey house. Not everyone bothered to shelter, even when the bombers were overhead. It was almost an act of defiance to stay in bed, despite the dangers. And as one Ipswich housewife put it, if we're going to be blown up, we might as well be blown up in comfort. Everyone knew the safest nooks and crannies of the house, under the kitchen table, or better still, beneath the staircase, which, being corrugated, tended to hold up even when the walls of the house were blown away. Most people found the Blitz a strangely dislocating experience. It was hard to live in an urban landscape which could change from day to day. To work in a town where the factory, the station or even your house might have been swept away overnight like a pebble on a beach. But entire populations did learn to live with the surreal horror of it and usually very quickly. It wasn't just city dwellers who had to adjust to a new reality. The life of the countryside was also transformed by the experiences of war. By 1940, Britain was effectively under siege. It seemed that the country might be starved into submission, and in the light of this danger, the very earth was mobilised, with millions of acres of grassland and wasteland ploughed to grow crops. Arable land expanded from 12 million acres in 1939 to 18 million acres in 1944. Even the moat at the Tower of London was used to grow vegetables. The cultivation of these new farmlands was too big a task for the nation's farmers to accomplish alone. The government's solution was to send a newly recruited army to work as farmhands. The Woman's and Land Army marched to the fields as if to the front. In December 1941, conscription was introduced for unmarried women between the ages of 18 and 30. They had the choice of going into the women's services, civil defence or industry. Doris White, an apprentice seamstress, chose industry, which in practice meant munitions. She went to work in an aircraft factory. At first, I was really shy, she said. I'd never worked with men before, but I became as interested in mending planes as I had once been in making dresses. Kitty Murphy was 18 when she began work in the Danger Buildings in, at Woolwich Arsenal. Her job was putting the caps on the detonators of bullets. It was dangerous, you had to wear special clothing, and no jewellery except for a wedding ring because the cordite used to fly up into your face. It caused a rash, impetigo, and it would come up in big lumps. Your eyes swelled up. It was very good money. I was earning £10 a week with danger money, but you earned every penny. <coughs> Despite the problems, many women relished the sense of freedom that came with a meaningful job and a solid income. Mona Marshall thought the war was the best thing that happened to us. My generation had been taught to do as we were told. At work, you did as your boss told you, and you went home to do what your husband told you. The war changed all that. It made me stand on my own two feet. Millions felt the same. The war did women a good turn, thought Hetty Fowler, who left her chip shop to join the ambulance service. They found out there were lots of jobs they could do, just as well as a man. Women had never thought like that before. It was a lesson they were not about to forget once the war was over. As the blockade of Fortress Britain took effect, the government took the, the bold step of introducing rationing. <coughs> Almost at the surprise of the authorities, <coughs> the move was at first welcomed. At least now, there would be fair shares. Bacon and ham, butter and sugar were restricted in January 1940, followed over the next two years by cooking fat, meat, tea, cheese, jam, eggs and sweets. To add variety and an element of choice, 
the ration was supplemented with a points allocation. This gave everyone coupons worth 16 points a month, which they could spend on biscuits, cereal, tinned fruit or fish. The points value of these foods could change. Salmon was rated at 16 points in December 1941 and at 32 points by March 1942. The grocer's stock response to any complaint about the lack of goods on sale was, don't you know there's a war on? Though the same shopkeeper might find a little something under the counter, half a pound of sausages perhaps, for a regular customer. The war laid waste to the nation's larders. Fresh fruit was the first casualty. Lemons and oranges vanished altogether and luxury fruits commanded extraordinary prices. Melons were going for £2 each in August 1941 and grapes sold for 17 shillings and sixpence a pound, which, is about, which was about 10 days wages for a private soldier. The banana also went AWOL early on and was sorely missed by those who remembered its lovely fleshy texture and its indescribable taste. Fresh eggs were like gold dust. Powdered egg imported from the United States only looked like gold dust. Every month from 1942, a tin of dried egg was offered in addition to the whole egg ration. The Ministry of Food optimistically told housewives that this was just like being allocated 12 fresh eggs. But Yorkshire pudding made with dried egg always came out of the oven as flat as it went in. People joked mirthlessly that dried egg sponge was only good for patching holes in the lino. <clears throat> Back gardens and public parks were conscripted for the war effort as soon as dig for victory became a national slogan. Suddenly every city dweller was an amateur farmer. By 1943 a million rabbits were kept by householders and by 1944 more than a quarter of the nation's fresh eggs were being laid in garden chicken sheds. The more ambitious urbanites tried to their hand at raising livestock. Pig clubs were popular in every corner of the country. Everyone in a street or a school would pool time and money to buy a pig <clears throat> and, place, and a place to raise it. By 1945, there were more than 7,000 such associations, their members all ready to devote hours to the distant prospect of a bacon sandwich. For many people on the home front, the war was experienced through the wireless set. The nine o'clock news rapidly became a daily ritual. The Bakelite set would be turned on a few minutes in advance to allow the valves to warm up. And then the family would gather in solemn silence to listen to the latest reports from the front. To listen to, uh, sorry, which were pre prefaced by the reassuringly authoritative words, here is the news. It was not so much a sharpened interest in current affairs that kept people tied to programmes, such as war report and into battle. It was more that most families had someone, a son, a brother, a husband, in the forces overseas, maybe in the thick of the fighting which was being reported. The newsreaders were now known by name, so that in the event of an invasion, it would be harder for the Germans to make English broadcasts with the authority of the BBC. Broadcasters were, with marked regional accents were employed for the same reason. It was thought that the Germans would find it hard to do a convincing impersonation of a Yorkshire accent. But music was the staple fare of the wireless, and it was music which did most to comfort the lonely, encourage the fearful and raise the spirits of a beleaguered nation. We'll meet again and the white cliffs of Dover. These simple melodies with their artless lyrics made a star of Vera Lynn because they express the emotional state in which millions spent the war, enduring the pain of separation and the dread of loss, but fighting to keep alive the hope of reunion. All over Britain and wherever in the world there were British soldiers, the words of the song were invoked like a prayer. 
Tears of another kind flowed when at last Germany surrendered. The date was May the 8th, 1945. We may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing, announced Churchill, not wanting the people to give up the fight before the war in the East was over. But the nation was hardly about to descend into an orgy of celebration. Many people seemed almost to have forgotten how to have that kind of fun. I rose placidly and put on the kettle, said Nella, last, a WVS worker in Barrow. I looked on the shelf and said, well, dash it, we must celebrate somehow. I'll open this tin of pears. And I did. Others managed to let their hair down a little. The Savoy Grill put on a special victory dinner of soup, chicken and iced peaches for five shillings. Muriel Green, a hostel worker in Somerset, toasted the day in cider and went to a dance hall where she found a crowd of drunk with the spirit of victory jitterbugging the night away. But for some, the sweetness of victory could not blot out the bitterness of years of struggle. Other parts of Britain may have been shouting, singing, dancing or trying to get drunk, said Naina Cox from Portsmouth, but not here. In Hampshire, we had a far higher quota of lost men. Hundreds went down on warships, never a word about them. For Pat Hazelhurst, whose husband Jack had been killed in 1944, VE Day was a day like any other. I didn't feel particularly sad that day because the sadness never leaves you. There was no reason for me to rejoice. My husband was dead. Some people were not free to join in. For us, it was an ordinary working day. No off duty, said Phyllis Horton, a nurse at Hammersmith Hospital. I worked from 7.30 in the morning until 8 that night. For other workers, victory brought about some happy chores. I consider VE Day one of the most enjoyable days I ever spent at work, recalled Rose Bell. Volunteers had been asked to deliver telegrams from ex-POWs who had been released. Some of the homes I visited were not even sure their loved ones were still alive. So it was wonderful news I was bringing them. So hopefully that little bit of a, a recap of that time will have evoked some um, memories that you may well be able to, to draw from, from your own past um, or to, to spark conversations with um, loved ones and neighbours about that period of time. Unfortunately at the moment we're not able to, to celebrate um, VE Day um, 75 um, years anniversary on Friday as we all would have hoped. Um, but that doesn't stop you um, having a, a little bit of a think about your own memories and maybe sending in some memories um, to us here at Age UK Trafford of that particular time. You can make contact with us through our email address, uh, which is admin at ageuktrafford.org.uk and we would really love to hear um, your memories of that time or your thoughts really of the celebrations um, that, are, that are coming up later on this week. Those people that send things in, we'll collate them and then we'll make another video um, in a few days' time to be able to read those stories out as well. And we'll continue with our reminiscences and walks down memory lane as well. In the meantime, stay safe everybody, enjoy the celebrations on Friday if you're able to, and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. <laughs>